Okay, so today's lecture, we're going into the ruling reptiles. I just used the word archosaurs. Today, birds and crocodiles are in the clade called archosauria. Archosaurs are literally like the ruling lizards, the arch lizards, the arch lizards. And you guys saw last week that turtles are uh, archosauromorphs. They're closer to these birds and crocodiles than either is uh, uh, to turtles. But uh, we're going to get into that diversity today. I really love this piece of paleo art. This is from... Um, eh, 20 some years ago, showing a very early member of the bird lineage and a very early member of the crocodile lineage. And I bet you can tell which one's which. Uh, and that's fun in the Triassic. And yes, the one on the left is a dinosaur. So let's get into it. Uh, here's our phylogeny. So we got into the archosauromorphs, all the reptiles. And you can see in the Triassic, there are just so many archosauromorph reptiles that do a lot of really wild things with their anatomy. And so you can see where birds, Crocodiles and turtles, we think, all fit together today. The turtles are the only ones that have a dotted line because that's like approximate. Turtle origins are a little bit murky, which I think is very fun. Uh, whenever I give like museum event style lectures and we talk about like vertebrate evolution, I always like to make the point that like you guys all have like smartphones in your pocket and we have a global internet and a space station and we can see like ancient galaxies from billions of years ago. We're not 100% sure what turtles are. And I think that's a fun thing to have that all be true at the same time. Uh, but turtles should fit somewhere within the archosauromorphs. On Thursday last week, you got three synapomorphies that are evolving somewhere in turtles. So it's not down here. It's up in there because some of them don't have it. And that's the carapace, the plastron, the two parts of the shell, and then, of course, the loss of the teeth, the marginal dentition, the maxilla, premaxilla, and the generate having teeth. All the turtles I showed you on Thursday last week all have their teeth or some kind of teeth still. And it's only the living turtles today and a bunch of ones from the Jurassic that don't have any teeth. But now let's go more towards the true archosaurs, the crocodiles and the birds. That's where we'll be today. There's this really important node within Archosauromorpha that is called Archosauriformes. And those of you that end up spending any time in like animal diversity, you're gonna see a really common pattern where there's like a clade and then the bigger clade is the same thing, Formes, and then the bigger clade than that is the same thing, Amorpha. And so that's a very common pattern of suffixes you might see. And so Archosauriformes has been designated for a really long time as this important clade because you can see one of the animals that defines it, these proterosuchids, which I'll show you here in a second, they, they are alive at the PT boundary. There are some proterosuchids from the Permian in Russia. They're one of the very, very, very few reptiles we actually have a good fossil of from the Permian. And then also in the earliest Triassic, those extinction recovery ecosystems, especially in places like South Africa, have these proterosuchids. So this clade here, proterosuchids plus the living crocs and the living birds is Archosauriformes. There's two features for Archosauriformes that despite everything we've learned in the last few decades, which has been quite a lot on these reptiles and their diversity, there's still two synapomorphies that Archosauriformes share that I want you guys to have. The first one is serrated teeth. So the front and back of the teeth have like that steak knife microstructure in the enamel. So they can slice through meat. So these are our very carnivorous animals. That's kind of the default uh, dietary ecology for archosauromorphs, archosauriformes. Obviously you've met a couple that might be herbivorous already. And so here's a really early archosauriform, Proterosuchus from South Africa. And you can see it's ridiculous and amazing nose. Um, and then a very, 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 very famous archosaur, Tyrannosaurus. And there's Tyrannosaurus's tooth blown up so you can see those serrations. So the serrated teeth are something that like a lot of these other archosauromorphs we might find fossils of in the Triassic, they don't have serrated teeth. That's something that can help us. The other one, and this is a very big one for everybody who likes dinosaurs or goes to museums and looks at fossils, is an ant orbital fenestra. So in front of the eye, anterior to the eye, a fenestra. So you guys have already heard of the lateral temporal fenestra, the upper temporal fenestra. Those are the two jaw muscle holes in the skull on each side for jaw muscles to attach. And remember, reptiles have a diapsid, those two holes, an upper and a lower temporal fenestra. Then there's the eyeball hole, that's called the orbit. And then the nose hole up front, that's called the nares, that's the nostril. But archosauriforms have wedged between a couple different bones, this bigger window thing called a ant orbital fenestra. I don't think anybody's going to be able to tell you very many interesting things about why they have it or what's it doing. It certainly lightens the skull and things like that. But certainly its presence is something people can reliably use when they find fossils to identify these creatures. So next time you're at a museum, um, look for the antiorbital fenestrae. All the dinosaurs have an antiorbital fenestra. Uh, and it's just something that's very, very helpful for identifying these guys. Okay. 
So those are some archosauriformes. On Thursday last week, I showed you guys a, a, a diversity slide for like these clades, this paraphyletic set of archosauromorphs, because obviously these are also archosauromorphs over here. Now let's do the same thing for the archosauriforms. Here's a bunch of archosauriforms that aren't in the crown group. So these are close relatives of birds and crocs today, but they're not in that group. They're on the way towards that group. So do what you did last week. Talk to your neighbors like you did for archosauromorphs. Tell me about these archosauriforms. What's their dealio? Yeah. The lower bag is like a bag. Yeah. 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 All right, what are some things people are noticing? There's some weird animals here. Various forms to well, I won't say like getting like around, but some are standing up, right? Um, yeah, yeah. There are events, and then others are kind of just uh, like how the early tetrapods were. Yeah, there's a, they're they're definitely a more a little more upright. Yep, I, they're still kind of a semi sprawl, like their legs are still out, arms are still a little bit, but they're definitely very much upright. They're not belly dragging at all by any means. That's for sure. Um, they're definitely carnivorous, which is fantastic. I heard somebody say this one, Erythrosuchus, is very famous, looks like a dinosaur. When this fossil was found, you guys can imagine, you know, for a long time, in like the middle of the 20th century, you can think of it as, like dinosaur origins, if you go back and like look at a book from like the 70s or something, there's always just like a cloud of question marks down in the Triassic, because there's so many animals like this. This skull's been known for a long time. This is the holotype of Erythrosuchus, which means the red crocodile, because it was found on a red stone, which is pretty cool. It's a humongous head, huge head on a, you know, for the body size, it's really tremendously huge, but it has that very T-Rex kind of vibe to it. That's the eye, lower temporal, upper, upper temporal, antorbital, nares. If I go back to the Tyrannosaurus rex skull, I mean, that's really fun. But this is a middle Triassic animal. It's definitely on all fours. And so these uh, massive carnivorous archosauri skulls tend to look pretty similar, which is really fun. That does look like a dinosaur. It's totally not. What other things? So the crocodiles. Some of them look like crocodiles for sure. That's kind of interesting. These two, Van Clevia, very long body. This one, Latorosuchus, is incredible. You can see how long it is. These are like very aquatic or even marine adapted, big old thick tails, reduced limbs, swimming around, fish eating teeth for sure, and something like Litorosuchus, which you can't quite see, I guess, in this image. Um, so aquatic adaptations happening again. I hope you guys are seeing like there's like this stock of like relatively small body, mostly carnivorous animals is almost always what's happening. And then somebody's going in the water, somebody's evolving herbivory. There's no herbivores on this slide. I'll tell you that much. Uh, not that we think so anyway. There's also these really weird enigmatic ones. This one up here, which is just a picture. Those three images up top are supposed to be it's like body and cross section. It almost has like a square to the top of its rib cage. Its ribs go. It's very cool, it has armor on its back. Uh, so there's a bunch of really fun weirdos in this clade. I love the Triassic, so I can't not show them to you, but we won't belabor it. So enjoy them. Know that they're real and they have nothing to do with anything we're going to talk about ever again. But 
they live their lives. Okay, so I kind of just said this. Almost everything so far is carnivorous. And so you guys have already talked about, you've already talked to me about uh, in the Carboniferous a little bit, a lot in the Permian, the many, many, many different amino ways of evolving to be herbivorous. You're going to see a lot more adaptations for things like herbivory, a lot more adaptations for things like getting into the water. And I just want you to always be kind of thinking about like on the phylogeny, the big patterns, the big changes, the big expectations you should have for yourself for each of these different gray boxes, like their starting conditions, because that really lets fossils be this amazing way to test patterns in evolutionary history if we can see things happen again and again and again. Okay, I've got two synapomorphies I want to give you guys for the crown group of Archosauria. So today that's crocodiles and today that's birds, but it includes so, so, so many of the most famous fossil animals are within this plate Archosauria here. So two synapomorphies, they're very, very different from one another. But before I can actually give those to you, we have to talk about breathing. So you guys know from when we were talking about osteichthyans, there's early actinopterygians, it's certainly sarcopterygian fishes today, that when they breathe, when they use an offshoot of their guts, the foregut diverticulum into like a little thing called lungs, they can take in air from the atmosphere and then get oxygen from it. And how fishes do that and how frogs do that today is they do this thing called buccal pumping. They are either swallowing, that's how they get the air down into their lungs. And so we see that in a lot of those fishes that can breathe. And we see that in things like uh, frogs today. Oh yeah, there it is. I should have hit this. Buccal pumping are what uh, fishes and frogs are up to and salamanders. O2 is way more abundant up in the atmosphere than it is dissolved in aquatic systems. And so amniotes almost always, as a default, flex their ribs to breathe. So an iguana and you aren't sitting here like this all day, like a frog would be doing. You guys have your ribs that are pretty sturdy, that are encasing your organs. You have muscles. Mammals, we'll talk about it later, have a very special muscle, a diaphragm that divides your thoracic from your lumbar region and helps expand your rib cage's volume so you can breathe in air. Costal ventilation, costal is ribs, is the way most of us amniotes default breathe. So most of the reptiles do this. Certainly us mammals do this. Amniotes use their ribs, for lack of a better term. Amniotes use their ribs to breathe. There's a person's ribs and their diaphragm going in and out. The air's brought in and in the alveoli of the lungs, there's all this exchange via osmosis from the bloodstream to that open air, getting rid of CO2, taking in oxygen. It works. That's most amniotes. Archosaurs are very, very, very different from the rest of us. And that means birds and crocs. You and I breathe like an iguana. Crocs and birds do their own thing and birds in a really extreme way. I'm not gonna explain this. I want you to talk to your neighbors, take a minute to try to understand what you're looking at here. How is this chicken actually getting oxygen from the atmosphere anatomically? Okay, go ahead. All 
All right, so no, uh, no shame. Anybody have no idea what's going on here at all? Anna, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> so, anybody have an idea of what they're seeing? Yeah, John. Is um that birds can kind of always have a have oxygen in their lungs, uh, because they're able to well, so like humans is we take oxygen in and we exhale, right? So the birds are able to do all this at the same time of inhale and exhale. And how are they doing that? Um help. I love that sentence. Birds are always breathing. Agree. Uh, How are they doing that? Yeah, I think I have an idea. It's that the, the oxygen and the, the oxygen and air aren't mixing together. So when you guys breathe, you have to take half the time to go, and then it's happening. And then you have to take another half of that same amount of time to go. And so you're breathing all the air, and just call it air, by the way. There's oxygen in it, but it's mostly nitrogen the whole time. So you're taking in the air, your body's like taking oxygen, getting rid of CO2, and then you're breathing out the same air. The part of your anatomy that exchanges, oopsie, the part of your anatomy that exchanges the different gases that you care about, one to get rid of, one to take in, is the same part of your anatomy that physically moves and moves the air around. Your lungs are like a bellows on fire. And so you have to take in air and push out air with your lungs, which are the structure that does the gas exchange. Birds have these air sacs, the balloon part of what you would think of as your lungs, that are in front and behind the actual structure, which does not move very much, where the gas exchange is happening. So they've got a little front and a little, so I guess it's like technically a back, even though it's first, and then a front, uh, which is the second part of the chamber system, where there's like a loop for all the air to flow through. And as the bags go like this, there's gas exchange in the middle and then leaving the body or entering the body up front. So they've decoupled the part of their body that does the in and out from the part of their body that does the gas exchange. So this is probably what you call a bird's lung because it is what, I mean, all of this is homologous with your lungs, but this is the part of the body that does the gas exchange. You can think of it as like the functional lung in terms of gas exchange. And then these things are called air sacs and they're kind of, you can think of it as the functional lung that does the like in and out of air movement. Does that make sense? So because this means every time the lungs or air sacs, we'll call them air sacs, every time the air sacs inflate and deflate, there's always another packet of air every time anything happens passing over the part of their anatomy that does the gas exchange. So birds are able to breathe much more efficiently than mammals or other reptiles. Does that make sense? Talk to your neighbors about that for a second. Try to say what I just said to your neighbor. See if they think what you said makes sense. <laughs> So just to say, birds breathe really efficiently. I trust that you guys are doing a good job talking to each other. You'll be able to keep coming back to this if you'd like to. Um, there's the truths about this. Like there's birds that fly over the Himalayas and birds can go a lot higher than mammals can because as the oxygen peters out, the higher up you go, they can handle that better because they're a little more efficient. But that's just one part of physiology, right? Circulatory system adaptations exist to get that oxygen to where it needs to go. Mammals have really excellent adaptations there. So when we're talking about the actual like drawing oxygen out of the air with your lungs, 
birds are more efficient, but I wouldn't call it like, wow, we really messed up. We should have that. <laughs> don't, so don't worry too much. But anyway, this is highly derived. And really only birds have it uh, in this way with these big sacs. So a synapomorphy for archosaurs, one of the two red lines I need you to have for archosaurs is this unidirectional respiration. And so here's a couple like more technical diagrams. This is of a duck's body showing like the lung is this rigid structure there, number two, and there's rear air sacs and front air sacs. Confusingly, the air goes to the rear ones first when it comes into the body. That's what I was saying a second ago. But so the air comes in, goes through the lungs, goes into these sacs, goes out the mouth again. So unidirectional respiration is the default for birds. Birds have these sacs that are really spread all over their bodies to do this. Most of you probably already know birds have hollow bones. That's true, and it's, it's, it's true in a couple of different ways. And so here's a, a nice diagram of a crow with the air sacs and the lung. But what's true in like a bird like a crow is the pelvis, the sternum, the vertebrae, the ribs are pneumatized. They're hollow. There's little holes in those bones, and the air sacs are inside the bones. That's where they're keeping these air sacs. So inside the rigid structures of their bones, these sacs are filling and not filling. You can't really see that unless you look inside the bones. So when we say bird bones are pneumatized, we're meaning the air sacs literally have little bits of themselves that invade the bone. You can see how messy that is. It's definitely something related to probably flight in these birds to make their bones extremely light. But this pneumaticity, it's called, when air sacs invade the bone, is spread across a lot of archosaurs. A lot of archosaurs have pneumaticity in their backbone, pneumaticity in some of their girdle elements, and there's air sacs most certainly invading those in animals that are no way flying. They're humongous. So that to me is really, really interesting. It's only been in the last 10 years or so that this feature became an archosaur synapomorphy. Crocodiles, this is CT data of crocodiles' lungs. Crocodiles have a lung that they fill by doing stuff with their rib cage. But the cost of ventilation, like you do, like an iguana does, crocodile is still kind of doing that. But also within the structure of a crocodile's lungs, which look pretty much just like lungs, there are diverticula, there are passages that inflate and deflate to move the air around. So crocodiles today do have unidirectional uh, inspiration, in unidirectional respiration, sacs in their lungs that aren't doing anything with oxygen, they're just moving the air around to help them breathe efficiently. No crocodile that we know of has these sacs that are invading its bones and making the bones light and pneumatic. But the crocodile condition is probably showing us what these early archosaurs had, and birds have a fancy pants version, which is very exciting to me. So unidirectional respiration, not breathing in and out, like most of us reptiles and mammals do, doing this thing where the air travels in a circuit. Very cool. The other thing that is absolutely not amazingly easy to find in the fossil record, but I'm a fan, and it optimizes this way if you do a study and do like ancestral state reconstruction, is we have really, really, really strong evidence that birds and crocodiles and their common ancestors should have pretty decent parental care. So that extends to everything from like building structures, building nests, to taking care of the offspring for a fairly significant amount of time after they are hatched. There are almost maybe none and almost none living archosaurs that don't do something like this. If you're a bird or a crocodile, you build nests and you take care of your babies. And so we can look at the fossil record and see what evidence we find for animals that are extinct archosaurs. And there's plenty of evidence in a lot of them for this kind of parental care. So it's very reasonable. Certainly it optimizes as such that parental care is a default, a synapomorphy for this clade of archosauria. Really interesting. I wanna just show you some pictures of this. This is from my comparative anatomy class because I just think it's so great people don't think about it enough. Lizards and snakes and other reptiles certainly do have sometimes levels of parental care, but crocs have really, really good parental care. I'm talking about females building nests and then guarding those nests for the whole time the eggs are incubating. I'm talking about like sometimes fathers being the ones in the pond where like maybe all those babies are his and when the babies are all swimming around, they just live on his back as they get bigger and bigger and bigger. So crocodilians have really excellent parental care. If that's not something that's on your radar, go ahead and Google it because it's like really fun to see all the videos of these big scary animals being like pretty good parents. Like <laughs> birds, I think you guys already know. 
And so what's interesting is you can take a bird like this, an ostrich. So this is a male ostrich. Male ostriches have a reproductive uh, uh, syndrome where what happens is he fertilizes eggs from females, the females lay their eggs, and then the females leave. And male ostriches like do all the parental care. He sits on the eggs, he raises the chicks. They're all his, they're all half siblings to each other, which is really fun. This bird, we don't know this yet in this class, you guys might already know this. Ostriches and their close relatives are sisters to all the rest of the living birds. So they're often used as like the default condition for the common ancestor of birds reproduction wise laying eggs on the ground, right? Instead of some fancy nest that hangs from a tree like some birds might have. And so if you take what we know about crocodile reproductive behaviors today and birds like ostriches today, we can get some idea of what we should expect. And certainly a lot of the dinosaur and pterodactyl kind of nests we do find are something like both of these, which is really interesting. So thinking about parental care and what it might look like, I think you guys can probably imagine the different like adaptive and naturally selected benefits of taking care of offspring. Obviously there's a cost because it takes your time and attention, but a higher, relatively higher investment in your offspring in these animals. So this is what an ostrich does today, lays its eggs on the ground, not much of a nest. Uh, you know, it's a nice patch of sand, but the next bop up on the bird tree of life is all the chickens and ducks, our sister to who's still left, to get your ostriches and your emus, the, your chickens and your ducks, and then all the rest of the birds. And some of those animals build really amazing nests. I don't know if you guys know about megapodes. Megapodes are a chicken relative. They live in like South and Southeast Asia and Australia. Uh, megapodes are famous for building these structures. That's the megapodes nest. So they make like a big pile of vegetation and dirt. They like have it layered specifically so that there's like vegetative rot and then there's heat inside the nest that they monitor. They like open it up in the daytime and cover it up in the nighttime but they're just like a little chickeny sized bird. And so it's fun that like an animal that is, you know, this tall builds a nest of like that structure. Both of these are early diverging relative to others, birds, and obviously user crocs. So all this helps us set our expectations for what we might see amongst the pterosaurs and the dinosaurs that are also investing in their offspring. Fun, fun, fun. Okay, here's our archosaur tree. Um, relationships there. You've got crocodiles, I hope pretty clearly, right here. And you've got your birds up in here, part of this bigger group of dinosaurs called theropods. There's a little bit of a smushiness right now, but I'm going to bet my money that the relationships amongst the major dinosaur groups look like this. The long neck ones go with the birds, and then all your like armored spiky duckbill guys are over here. Pterosaurs, pterodactyls, these are animals that you guys have seen your whole life. They always are, there we go, Henry, thank you very much, hold it up. <laughs> animals that are absolutely always associated with dinosaurs, and you guys can see they actually are very close relatives of dinosaurs, but I hope you all are well enough educated in biology to know that they technically are not dinosaurs. They are very close relatives, not dinosaurs themselves. Hilariously, a penguin is a dinosaur and a pterodactyl isn't, and that's just how it is, which is really fun. So there's our major clades, right? You guys know crocs, you know birds, and you probably heard of some dinosaurs, and I hope you've heard of pterodactyls at least a little bit. There's, of course, much more diversity than that to help us understand all these transitions. There's our two archosauria synapomorphies, the unidirectional respiration and the parental care. Here's some Triassic representatives of those clades. I don't need you to look at a magpie and a Nile crocodile anymore. These are what Triassic early dinosaurs, early pterosaurs, and early crocodilomorphs looked like back then, 200 and some million years ago. Here's our animals that help us understand the origins of things like pterosaurs, the origins of things like dinosaurs. And here's a whole lot more scary archosaurs on the crocodile side of things. So these are within the crown group. And you can see there's so, so, so many. I kind of show you guys too many things in the Triassic and that's like not my fault. That's just how many crazy things show up in the Triassic. So what we can colloquially call these two sides of Archosauria are the croc line and the bird line. These are all bird line archosaurs. So pterodactyls are bird line archosaurs, but they're not dinosaurs. And then everything over here is on the croc line. Obviously there's some really interesting things happening here and don't worry, we're definitely gonna spend some time with it. So let's talk about these crocodile line archosaurs that are themselves not crocodilomorpha. You can see every single one of these clades shows up in the Triassic and is extinct by the end of the Triassic. The crocodile line archosaurs have a 
crazy impressive set of radiations within the Triassic where they take on a lot of very different ecologies and a lot of very surprising morphologies. This animal here is called a phytosaur, phytosauria, the plant lizards. They are absolutely not herbivores. Uh, I don't remember the detail why they're called phytosaurs. I think their early teeth looked like a leaf or something. Do you guys remember? But anyway, it's a, it's a hilarious misnomer to me because that means a leaf lizard and that's its face. <laughs> Um, so these animals, I will let you interpret for yourself in a second. What's interesting is that amongst the crocodile line archosaurs, you certainly get an erect gait, but they do it in a way that's completely different from what birds and mammals end up doing. Dinosaurs really and mammals end up doing, but they still do have their legs straight under their bodies. I'm just going to put up a couple here and let you talk about them. There's your phytosaur. Here's a bunch of these guys with the armor, Aetosaurs. Here's some of these poposaurs, which are probably my favorites, two of them. And here's a bunch of these things I have in quotes called Rausukians. That is a dinosaur right there with a the long neck. That's the Rausukian right there. All right, talk to each other for a little bit about these crocodile relatives. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hearing a lot of fun combos. What are we talking about? Seeing a trend towards bipedalism, maybe. Where? Um, in the lower right, but all. Ephigia. There are three named animals in this group. They're called Shubasaurs. Fantastic animals. Uh, I overuse them all the time when I'm talking to the public about things. These are bipedal, toothless, probably at least one of them herbivorous crocodile relatives. <laughs> so not your, not what you're probably expecting. And an excellent example of how crazy the Triassic is. This animal, not this one, Ophigia, but another one called Shubasaurus in the group, when it was first found, everybody just assumed it was an early toothless dinosaur because it's on two legs and it's got this delicate face with a beak at the end. No. Nope. It's a crocodile. <laughs> Everything about the rest of its anatomy is crocodilian. And now we have other animals related to it. Believe it or not, this sail one is related to it. Um, so there's a radiation of bipedal crocodile relatives. I have found them in Africa um, and they're all over South America and North America. Fantastic. Do they have osteoderms? No. Okay. So these animals don't have any heavy duty armor. A lot of them do. These ones do. Not that one. 
What other things? The herbivores. We've got lots of herbivores. Uh, certainly within the Aetosaurs, this group right here are very much herbivores all the way to their extinction. They are armored. They have. They look like the dinosaurs you guys might have heard of, but like Hylosaurs with all the armor spikes on their back and the gloves on their tail. Most of these guys have something that looks like this, the crocodilian version, like heavy duty armor. Their osteoderms are really easy to find as fossils. They're big rectangles that fit together like housing, like roof shingles, which is really cool. Only does Matasuchus and a couple others actually have like awesome spikes on their shoulders. Most of them don't have spikes at all. Early members of the group though are animals like this, Reveltosaurus. You guys are gonna see Reveltosaurus on Thursday for a totally different reason. Uh, but these animals have plant-shaped teeth. They're eating plants. Um, and these later ones have no teeth up at the front. They definitely have like a long extended premaxilla. That's kind of a scoopy looking thing. So everybody thinks they might be have like a pig kind of ecology, like rooting around in the dirt, pulling up tubers and things like that. Which is really fun to imagine this uh, relatively large body animal doing. Not all of them are large. Uh, there's one from some fossil sites in Colorado I work at where like the whole body like was like this. So not all eatosaurs are huge, but they all seem to be herbivores for the most part. Maybe some of the early ones are a little omnivorous. There is a lot of upright stance here. And so what you're seeing in this image, I know it's not so clear on the slide, but you guys can look at it on Moodle later. Dinosaurs, mammals, we stand erect. We'll talk about it more on Thursday. And what we do is we have on our femur a head that sticks in. Your femur is your femur, and then there's a part of it that goes into your pelvis. These animals don't have that. Their femora, their femur, is pretty much straight. And what they've done is the ilium, the hip bone, sticks out and like rests, quote unquote, on top of the femur. So instead of the femur having a head that goes into the hips, the hips like kind of come around the femur. And it lets them keep their pretty boring looking femora underneath their bodies. It's really fun. These animals like Prestosuchus and Phasalosuchus here, which is humongous, the skull of that one, it's like this big, like the skull. It's crazy. These are gigantic, awful monsters. These are time machine monsters I would not want to meet. Fully terrestrial. How about that? These are all croc relatives and almost nobody lives in the water at all. The phytosaurs do. They swim around. They're crocking before crocs are crocking, which is really cool. The thing that's fun about phytosaurs is like when you guys are going to Disney and you see an alligator or you go to the Everglades and see an alligator, or if you ever go out into the world somewhere and see a crocodile, when a crocodile is trying to hide, what's going on with its eyes and its nose? Yes, just like this, right? <laughs> you know, like this. So crocodiles have their nostrils at the end of their face and their eyes, and then when they come up, it's just eyes and nose and they're separated. Phytosaurs sure do look like crocodiles, but even back in the 1800s, people knew they weren't crocodiles because their nostrils are here. So that's the eyeball. That's the little antiorbital fenestra. Eyeball and nostrils on like this little chimney. And so their snout would be like way out like this, but this would be what's above the water. Really fun. So very similar to crocs. No question, are they waiting at the side of the water and then absolutely grabbing somebody who comes to get a drink? Look at those teeth. Look at how like raptorial, how hooked that jaw is. Fantastic animals. And these guys can get quite big, uh, which is very cool. One thing I hope you guys take away is on Thursday and then just a few minutes ago, I showed you some archosaurus morphs, some archosaurus forms, not in the crown group, tons of morphological diversity, really crazy. These are in the crown. These are related to today's crocodiles. And I hope you see that today's crocodiles aren't really much like this at all. And so we're going to talk about that. Anything else people are wanting to say about pseudosuchians? They are a lot of the interesting terrestrial diversity of archosaurs in the Triassic period. You find them everywhere. They're pretty important and fun. Let's talk about the crocs, though. These are the true crocodilomorphs that exist in the Triassic. So you can see they don't show up all that late. They're next to all these guys. These are the early crocodilomorphs. I'm going to take away that Nile crocodile because it's hurting your brain. You shouldn't have to look at that living one, which is not representative. So it's gone now. Here's a bunch, Terrestrosuchus. Latargosuchus is technically from the early Jurassic. This beautiful skeleton, here's the head of Dramesiosuchus. There's another one. Carnflex is awesome. Talk to each other real quick about these early crocodilomorphs. These are the closest things you've seen this whole class to today's crocodiles. Tell me about them. 
So a lot of people call these early crocodilomorphs like just the Triassic greyhounds. Like there's these little wiry, fast, probably very fun. Like if you want a pet, hashtag pet from paleontology, like this is a very strong contender, I would say. These early crocodilomorphs are like this big and uh, really long legs. Nobody's in the water. Everybody's on land, legs underneath their bodies. Very quick, probably. Uh, they certainly grow quickly, do histology on them. Very much unlike probably the animals you think of as crocodilians today, which is really fun. This is such a beautiful specimen. There's the eyeball, antorbital fenestra. Armor down the back, but only on the back. And then look how long that femur is and how long that tibia is on uh, Dremicosuchus. Very, very fun animals. So these are what crocs, true crocs, you could think of it as, look like in the um, Triassic. Any other comments on these? They're great. So you've seen this already. I showed you guys this slide when I made the point about how there's no Permian reptiles and it makes me so furious all the time. You saw this and you all very correctly were like, yeah, there's a lot more black bars up there in the Triassic. You don't have to look at all the black bars again, but I did want to put all the silhouettes up there. So now at least you have a little bit of like, a, oh, okay, now I've seen half this stuff. <laughs> so that's where they all go. Here's your lizards and snakes. There's a bunch of Triassic uh, wild, wild stuff. And then there's your pterodactyls, there's your dinosaurs, crocs are over here. And then here's all those animals you've just seen. The Triassic is a pretty cool time for archosauromorph evolution. And it's really interesting to me that only a handful, a handful of clades make it out of the Triassic. Crocodiles make it out, three dinosaur lineages make it out, pterodactyls or pterosaurs make it out. All the rest of that diversity is contained to the Triassic. Pretty wild. All right, so now let's go over to this side, the bird line, getting our way towards the dinosaurs. I have no idea. I can't get the temperature of you guys. If you've been like waiting to get to dinosaurs this whole time or not. <laughs> Sometimes that's the case. So I've got two characters here. You can see the earliest clade of bird line archosaurs, these animals here called abanosaurs. We're not going to talk about them, but I hope you can see that they're quadrupedal. Some of them have uh, armor. If they're not here, then they're here. And so you can see how the earliest even bird line archosaurs look a lot like the quadrupedal uh, carnivorous ancestors of all archosaurs, of all archosauromorphs, all archosauroforms, archosauromorphs. It's really cool. But one tick up past that clade is the pterosaurs, so pterodactyls, and all the dinosaurs. And they have a common ancestor right here. And I have two snip morphs to give you guys for that node. Pterosaurs and dinosaurs certainly do share quite a bit. And so one, and this has been known for a long time and has helped paleontologists differentiate all these different archosaurs into the ones that are on the crocodile side versus the ones that are on the dinosaur side. So that one that's bipedal on the crocodile side, Ephigia that you just saw, has a crocodile ankle, clear as day. That's how we know it's not some kind of dinosaur thing. And so what do we mean by mesotarsal ankle is between the tarsal bones of a crocodile so the astragalus and the calcaneum, which you guys have, your astragalus is where your tibia touches your foot, your calcaneum is like your literal heel. Crocodiles have a joint between the astragalus and the calcaneum, and it allows their foot to kind of rotate like this in a way that yours cannot. 
Dinosaurs have something that's not quite like what we have, but it's their own thing. But the astragalus and the calcaneum are touching each other, and the joint between the lower leg and the foot is straight, and it's past both of those tarsal joint, tarsal bones. And so a like dinosaur foot moves like this relative to its lower leg, and crocs do more of a rolling thing. And so this sort of plane of rotation in a crocodile or in Rodeltosaurus, that's the crocodile style ankle. Not all the birdland archosaurs, those are phanosaurs I just showed you, they don't have this. But the pterosaurs and dinosaurs and their common ancestry have this mesotarsal ankle. So you can think about it as like, here's a very small early member of almost certainly the pterosaur lineage called Scleromachlis. You can see it's a little hoppy, very small little dude. And so there's a joint right there at the top of the foot that's flat and allows a lot of uh, efficient movement front to back, but not really side to side in this little long legged animal. Look at that little skeleton, isn't it wild? Like, look at that's it's like a little torso from the front. These are very weird little animals. The other feature goes right with it is that parasagittal gait. So I'm talking about having your legs directly underneath your body and they're doing it like we mammals do it by having an interned femoral head that goes into their hips. So some of the crocodilians you've met, the Sudasukians you just saw, I'm sorry, they also have a parasagittal gait, but they do it in a different way. The pterosaur dinosaur common ancestor has this kind of a parasagittal gait. Again, that hinge is showing you that mesotarsal ankle I just explained, where the joint is after the astragalus and the calcaneum are together. So you have this like only in this plane of movement, foot and leg, and then the leg itself goes front to back. Dinosaurs are easy to like pretend to be because we walk like they walk in a lot of ways. It's harder to do a crocodile impression that's very convincing because you have to do things that your body can't do. So the parasagittal gait is a pterosaur plus dinosaur thing. The mesodarsal angle is a pterosaur plus dinosaur thing. All right, let's go up on the pterosaur side of the tree. Pterosaurs are extremely important biological entities. They are the oldest example of vertebrates evolving flight. They can fly. That's a really, really radical new way of getting around for vertebrates in the Triassic. You guys have already seen more than half of vertebrate evolutionary history and absolutely no one is flying. And then the first plane to evolve powered flight are pterosaurs and they do it in the Triassic. So do me a favor, talk to each other for a little bit here, answer that question. I'm pretty sure that all of the is like a different All right, anybody have a number that they're like confident about? Yes, John. Uh, I'd say like four. Four, he says four. Anybody have four? Uh, Less? Four also? I'll, I'll double up with eight. Whoa, eight. <laughs> Anybody going less than four? What were the four you were thinking of? Uh, birds. Love it. Dinosaurs. I saw that today already. Uh, the birds. And, and then last one being insects, but I guess with that, there's like probably these like many different ways, but I just kind of threw them in a cluster. Okay. So we got birds, bats, pterosaurs, insects. Were those your four? Yeah. Your group's four? Gary, what are your other four? I gave insects an extra four. I know they independently evolved like one of them, so I just couldn't remember how many times. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or no. not. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> 
Okay, everybody comfortable? Feel like we know these things? So at least four, at least four, because there's two parts to this question. What exactly do we mean by powered flight? Most biomechanics who talk about powered flight mean an animal that like with its own anatomy, so not like riding an air wave that's flowing at its face or something, uh, can like make themselves move around in the air of their own volition. They go up, they go down, they can fly around intentionally. There are so many animals that have evolved gliding, jumping out of trees or jumping off of cliffs or jumping off of anything and then going like this and flying around Buzz Lightyear style, falling with style, but powered flight, actually doing stuff at least four times. Once, and I'm happy to learn this, Gary, because I don't remember exactly either. Once amongst insects, so the clade of insects called pterygoda, which is the common ancestor of dragonflies and everything else, the default condition in insects is wings. There's certainly lots of insects that have lost their wings. There's certainly animals in the insect in the insect world that have done weird things with their wings, like beetles have a hard shell. That hard shell is the front pair of wings, and then they only have one pair underneath, instead of having two pairs like they're supposed to. So that's interesting. But at least once in insects, and then you guys said it three times in vertebrates. And so powered flight is obviously extremely efficient in some ways, it's very costly in other ways. It's a pretty derived locomotory condition. So all four of these animals, but we're only gonna worry about the vertebrates today, can fly, but how do they fly? So here are the bones of the arm of a pterosaur, of a bird, of a bat. I'm gonna transition you guys off pterodactyl and say pterosaur for the rest of this class. Uh, it's a pterosaur, a bird, and a bat. There's the bones that are labeled. Here's the structure of their wings. They all do it. I'll let you read that. And we're going to take at least like five minutes on this. And go ahead and get your pencils out if you want to. As you start forming your sentences, don't forget someone write it down because that really forces you to be clear. Okay, sorry, go ahead. I don't see it there. Yeah, I didn't start right here. This is definitely not. It's extrapolated. It's pretty much. I'm like, oh, right, right. So initially, we can say that in bats, you only have this, like, at the risk of memory. You know what I'm saying, right? Looks like. Oh yeah, but the birds are huge. They're like the wing. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Mm. I mean, technically, they're right. But they're not working past there. Yeah. 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 Hmm. And it's sort of that I don't know, it's like, maybe write this down for what's first. Let's just take a nice and really cut. We can see the leading part. There's some other bad or really first words when we say it'll cut really as well. It's going to be a Oh, that's the other fly that you would Or is it bird? Like, if I take a couple of feathers out, that's, that's, that's going to come back. You know, that's scary. Like that. that. So, I, I almost tried to do like a white circle, like, to use the color of the white color, put some silver there. I just yeah. didn't do it again. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. Excuse me. Is this whole diagram? All right, any groups feel like they have a sentence or three? I think we got two. You think you got two? Uh, there's clearly utility of homologous structures or different functionalities amongst the, the three groups. Um, also, the all three uh, clays demonstrate a planeform wing, uh, which functions as an airfoil in a similar way to demonstrate convergent evolution. So the, the shape of a wing maybe is a convergent structure. We'll say more about the homology or anybody who wrote about the homology. What, what do we say though? Yes, it is true, of course. They're all unique homologous elements. What are the homologous parts? What are the not homologous parts? Well, the phalanges are the most distinctive uh, uh, difference amongst the group, I think. Um, so the fingers, bats got five fingers, like any good red-blooded mammal. Birds got three, pterosaurs got four. One, two, three, and then this is the fourth finger. So how about the fact that the homologous structures here are just the skeletal elements? They all have phalanges, they all have a radius, they all have a normal, they all have a humerus. Just like any good sarcopterygian, a coelacanth, a lungfish, a bat, a bird, and a pterosaur all have a humerus, that one monobasal. So they've inherited a similar skeleton, they've inherited the same skeleton, and they've changed it adaptively to convergently make what uh, Paul said, these like wing airfoil. Who else wants to share some sentence stuff they wrote? Looking for people to like, Use those words and then say the thing that is the homology or say the thing that is convergence. I think the airfoil shape is absolutely a convergence. What other convergences do you see? So that's interesting. Hannah just said all the all the finger bones of the bird are inside, like the meat of the wing. Whereas in the pterosaur, there's exposed fingers and claws, and the bat there's exposed fingers and claws. The bat and the pterosaur are both stretching skin between their fingertips. Isn't this remarkably crazy? This is the ring finger. Just this is the ring finger of a pterosaur. You got your thumb, you got your pointer finger, you got your middle finger, and then a hilariously long ring finger. And then there's skin that goes from the tip of that finger all the way to the body, like this. That's very, very weird. Bats have a similar thing between their pinky 
and the back of their body, skin, and then skin between the fingers. The pterosaur doesn't have skin between the fingers. It has skin between one finger and the body. The bat's got that, plus here and here and here, too. The bird has feathers, which are part of its like dermal outer covering. They're basically highly evolved scales that they've made long and they can fly on them. That's crazy. What do these people notice? Pterosaur is humorous and do it all lot. Ooh, Henry, do you have a take on that? Is the pterosaur's humor is doing a whole lot? Yeah, notice that huge, you notice that big projection of the face, the humorous, that is the delta vertebral crest, that is where really beefy um, arm muscles would have attached to. So the humorous was doing quite a bit. It is short relative to the length of the humorous in the other two. Pterosaurs also get way bigger than these two tend to get, especially when they're flight capable, which is interesting. I just like to have you guys really look at this and take in and think about it. Um, five digits, three digits, four digits, but still it's hand bones. I'd also like to point out that in, that in bats, uh, even, even in the skin mount wings of the pterosaur, the bats, uh, not only did not only the pterosaur just have one finger, but each of the fingers of the bat wing also, also incorporate the metacarpus. And they're not articulate, and they're not attached to each other. And each is oh, I see. So, 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 this bone, this bone, this bone, and this bone are the hand bones. And so, for the bats, the hand and the fingers are spread. That's what you're saying. Whereas in the pterosaur, that's the hand bones right there, this part, and then it's only the finger that goes long. Yep. That's a, I, I appreciate that. I've never really looked. I've never considered talking about that detail before. Anyway, I like, I like how quickly you were all able to say, oh, you know, bats fly, birds fly, pterosaurs fly. That's true, but it's really fun to take in all the different ways they've managed to do that. Yeah. Well, one more thing, up to now, we've been seeing a trend to upright gait and legs uh, underneath the weight of the body. Here we see a quick evolution of the, to a hyperbole forelimb, uh, which would be kind of sprawling or flapping in this case. If you're quadrupedal. If you're quadrupedal. That's interesting, right? So what's the early pterosaurs? What are the early bats? What are the early birds? What's their posture like? Well, well, you guys probably don't know that yet. We'll like get into it. Are they quadrupeds or bipeds? All right. So let's talk about some of these early pterosaurs. Uh, you can see there's a group of animals here. These are animals that were formerly considered to be probably close relatives of dinosaurs. And it's only been in the last five years that this clade has very convincingly moved from being here to being here, which I know isn't that crazy looking on this slide, but I'm telling you, pterosaurs have always been sort of a problem because the oldest pterosaurs we have from the beginnings of the late Triassic are teeny little things that have their wings with their long ring finger. And so it's like, I don't have any half pterosaurs to show people. Where's the transitional pterosaurs? This plate of animals called Ligurpetids, now that they go here, and I think that's really convincing, there's several of them that are helping us understand the transition to what we would call the true pterosaurs and to that flight. It's really an exciting time. So I've got one Snape Morphe though that I'm gonna give you for true pterosaurs. I don't think you'll find it challenging to remember this Snape Morphe. They have this membranous wing, a wing made of skin. And so you can see that there's different parts of the wing that have different uh, anatomical terms, the chiropatagium, the curopatagium, the propatagium, <laughs> which is the front part of the wing. Part of having a membranous wing, pterosaurs have this like lead on their wing. Birds have the same thing, bats have the similar thing, all convergently evolved to like start that airfoil as they're flying. Pterosaurs have this really incredible carpal bone, a wrist bone that sticks out like this called the pteroid, it's specific to them. And it's a wrist bone that holds up that leading edge of the wing before you hit the actual arm bone. Once you get out into the distal wing, past the hand, the bone is the edge, but here close into the body, there's this flap and that pteroid bone holds it out. I'm putting membranous wings there with an asterisk because there's so, so, so many adaptations that make this wing very derived. It's not just skin. There's layers to the skin that allow it to really stretch and move with an elasticity. Bats have similar structures in their skin wings, um, but they're not at all just like loose and flappy with the pterosaur lands. They're very elastic. Um, this is a cross-section like through the wing, 
So air sacs, pneumatic bones invading the actual bone of the arm, bone of the hand, and then the soft tissue wedge, and then the wing is very, very, very thin in cross-sectional structure. And these are all these different layers that are in the wing's soft tissues, including a vascular system, which is really interesting. I always think to imagine things like color on pterosaurs and pterosaur wings. Henry's a bit of a pterosaur expert. Would you say anything about like just pterosaur wings in a general way? Because this is my only like pterosaur wings slide. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there are the other um, pterosaur wings would have been a bit would have been uh, more solid than you would have you would expect. It's definitely not easy to damage, not as easy to damage um, even as the bat wings, especially due the especially due the layer of actin fibrils. Or like you can sort of see this fiber. There's they're sticking out. They sort of go perpendicular to the bones of the arm, and they would have helped support the wing in flight. Very derived structure. These guys are like these little archosaurs, especially at the beginning. They get big later. Little archosaurs that have these little wings attaching their ankle to their outer ring finger. Very cool. So membranous wings for pterosaurs. So let's talk about that pterosaur transition. What I have here are a couple of Triassic pterosaurs, some skeletons and some artistic reconstructions, Cabaramus eudimorphodon. Articodactylus is the oldest known true pterosaur. It's also quite tiny. It's like this big. And then here's one of those Lagerpetids, this animal called Dromomeron is one of them that are uh, in this new group that's just been coined and everybody's loving called Pterosauromorphs. So do me a favor, talk to each other about these early pterosaurs, make some observations about them, their anatomy, their possible ecologies. Let's do pterosaurs for a second. So I, I'm I'm trying to be cognizant of the time. I just want to say, like, so on this really this Triassic pterosaur here, I think it's really awesome for you guys to get to see this. Like, look, here's your hand bones. One finger, two finger, three finger, and then like out of the fossil block is that fourth finger. So cool on this little hand. You can see there's pretty interesting teeth. A lot of these early pterosaurs have pretty remarkably different dentitions, which is really interesting to think about their ecology. I can tell you guys, we'll talk about it later, that when a clade evolves flight, it usually radiates extremely quickly. Birds and bats are extremely diverse. For bats are the second most diverse uh, order of mammals. Birds are the most diverse group of tetrapods. So flight and speciation and adaptation seem to really go hand in hand. So dietary ecologies, how you eat, certainly a big part of adaptation. This is Articodactylus, the earliest known true pterosaur. And you can see, like, it's got a pretty mono little wing. It's a real cutie pie. Uh, it's an animal that's currently under study, and I'm really excited to see what comes out when that thing finally gets CT scanned. It's been taking years for that to happen, but that's okay. And then this animal is this one that is formerly thought to be a dinosaur relative, now thought to be a pterosaur relative. I want to show you some of the things that make that exciting. So I love this diagram. Um, this diagram really helps, I think, set the stage for like different levels of like biological science and evolutionary hypothesis testing. So when we talk about bird evolution in a little bit from dinosaurs, it's almost a joke how many beautiful fossils we have to show little dinosaurs become things that you guys are like, well, that's just a bird. 
bats and pterosaurs kind of just show up. The earliest pterosaurs have wings, the earliest bats for sure straight up have wings. And so that transition within mammals, that transition within these archosaurs to a flying form is murky. But because we've just now realized that animals like this one and animals like this one, a tree climbing, big handed, big claws on the hands too, animal. We know this animal, we know this animal, we know these animals. No one's ever found anything like this. And so right now, people who are doing pterosaur origin work, people who are studying these animals are trying to decide what pieces of anatomy we should expect to see, what kind of ecological changes we should see, if what it looks like is the case, is we went from some sort of like ground dwelling, light bodied, hopping little predator to somebody who can scurry up and down trees and eventually somebody who can fly. And so in the modern world today, gliding squirrels, gliding lemurs, gliding marsupials, gliding frogs, a million gliding lizards. It's not that weird for a tree dwelling animal to evolve gliding. That happens a lot. We've never found something like this in this clade yet. But how many times does gliding become powered flight? Is that even how it works? It's not really necessarily how we think it works in birds, it might be. So this is a really great lab to help set our expectations as people like from different ends of the problem maybe can stitch towards each other. Does that make sense? When this diagram came out on Twitter uh, by this artist who's just spectacular, um, I just loved it because they're not labeled as like known, known, theoretical, theoretical, known, but that's what they are. That's really fun. How do you go from no wing to a wing? The pterosaurs and bats right now, we can't really show you. That's okay, because we'll just keep looking but it's kind of a problem. All right, as we go uh, towards the end of class here today, I think we can do it, make our jump over to the dinosaurs. You can see there's this other clade of animals, very near and dear to my heart, some of the first animals I ever worked on are these animals called silosaurs, the closest relatives of dinosaurs without technically being dinosaurs themselves. We're not gonna talk about them today, but you can see they're quadrupedal, quadrupedal, common ancestor here might be quadrupedal, quadrupedal, now we're going over to our true dinosaurs to get ready for Thursday. I have one synapomorphy to give you all for dinosauria. I'm extremely confident in it, believe it or not. And that one synapomorphy is bipedality. The common ancestor of the three major clades of dinosaurs, theropods, sauropodomorphs, or the long neck dinosaurs, and ornithischians, which are all the ones that have horns and clubs and duck bills, all the Triassic members of dinosauria, especially at the beginning, are little bipeds. And so this is a hugely successful radiation of bipedality. Living birds are the most diverse tetrapods. They are also bipeds. That bipedality is inherited from this dinosaurian common ancestor. Birds don't become bipedal. Dinosaurs become bipedal. Birds are still bipedal. And so when you guys think of dinosaurs, you probably don't think about a lot of bipeds. Certainly the ones that are mostly meat eaters, like the theropods, this is a Triassic member. Here's a really late member. I'm sure you've heard of it, called Tyrannosaurus rex. <laughs> Absolutely a biped. But other times, clades go quadrupedal, and that almost always is associated with massive body size. This animal is a Triassic relative of the big long neck dinosaurs. You can hold it in your hands like a little dog. The bigger ones later are 70 tons and on four legs. Probably as they get huge, they drop down to all fours. That happens many times amongst the bird hip dinosaurs, the ornithischian dinosaurs. Triassic representatives, if there is one, are these bipedal things. And then the armored guys, the horned guys, they end up on four legs, and that's probably because of a massive body size. But early horned dinosaur fossils, early armored dinosaur fossils are all bipeds. And so that bipedality is the ancestral condition for dinosaurs, which is really fun because bipedality is super rare. We do it, kangaroos do it, uh, these things. End of list, maybe? I'd be happy if anybody thinks of another vertebrate biped. <laughs> it's not very common, but we certainly live that life. So here we are, we finally arrived. Uh, here's a nice look at your dinosaur biodiversity. Your bird hip dinosaurs on one side, horns, duck bills, armor and spikes. And the other side, long neck dinosaurs and your meat eating dinosaurs. And within those meat eating dinosaurs are the birds. And so we're going to bust into dinosaurs officially on Thursday. And I hope you're stoked because I'm finally glad to be here. Okay, <laughs> thank you.